Good morning and welcome again to another of the Veterans Forum programs. We're coming to you from the uh, Manchester Public Television Studios here on Elm Street in Manchester, New Hampshire. Today is October the 23rd or 4th. Don't check me on the dates. We have trouble with that sometimes. This program, as you may or may not know, is being put on in conjunction with the Library of Congress. They have a program called the Veterans History Project and they've asked stations such as this throughout the country, and guys like me, if they can and will help guys and gals who served in any branch, any war, from World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Desert Storm, whatever, if they can and will come and share their stories with us so that they have a permanent history record of the people who made that history without any frills and so forth. All the stories you hear are the same theme, but every guy and gal who's been to the show so far, and I've done about 92 so far, have a little different twist because it's what they did in the scheme of things. As an example, I was told way back when that uh, World War II, for example, there were some 16 million guys and gals surfing throughout the world doing their thing. Each one of us had a job to do, and we did it. Uh, to try to set the stage physically, imagine it's a great big puzzle. Each one of us is a piece of that puzzle. And the more people, the guys and the gals, who can come forward and tell their story, it makes a better story for the people coming after us. And the most important thing I think you'll find as you get to be over 21, like most of us are today, you had a job to do and you did it, and a lot of times it was an attitude, well, it was just a job to do and it was done. But the important thing to remember, and you've probably been asked this many times by your friends or family, you know, hey, Grandpa, usually, what did you do in the war? Well, sometimes you've got to stop and think, now, which war are you talking about? Ours, for example, was World War II. We had Korea, Vietnam, Desert Storm, each one a different war, but the same activities was performed. And if you don't tell your story, nobody else will. And statistically, the bad news is of that 16 million that we had starting back then, I've been told that lately, the last year or so, there are maybe three million of us guys and gals left. But the hooker, they're dying off at the rate of anywhere from 12 to 1,500 a day. If you fight the calendar and the time clock, that means a lot of us aren't going to be around here forever or much longer. So if you can and will and want to come and share your story while you still can, please, we're here to help. We'll do anything we can to make this an enjoyable, but more important, a rewarding experience. And when you get through, a lot of the guys say, whew, you know, I'm glad I did that. It's over. I've got that off my mind. Today we have another young fellow here who's going to tell you his story as he lived it, as he did it, and as he made it happen. I'll show you, this is what Jack looked like way back when, okay, 1946. I'll introduce him and then have him take it from there and we'll run the show. Are you ready? Sir, would you identify yourself, your name, rank at discharge, and where you live today. Yeah, I'm uh, John W. Merrill, better known as Jack. I was born and brought up in Worcester, Mass. And uh, I went through the different phases and wound up as a B-24 pilot, and I was discharged as a captain. Good. Back in... My serial number was... A O eight thirty three nine fifty one. You'll never forget that. I guess it's not. Same as your age and your height. Right. Okay. Now you're living now in where? In Manchester. I'm living in Manchester, New Hampshire, and I've lived here since nineteen fifty five. Oh, Anui. Anui. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now, what I'd like to do, so that it makes it easier for you and interesting for those people, uh, let's go back and start, as you said. Where and when were you born, and what was your life like growing up back in the Depression years? So that people get an idea that it wasn't always uh, sweet, cream, and so forth. Well, it, it wasn't as bad as some people 
Good. pointed out to me. But I was born in Worcester, Mass, November 12th, 1923. And my childhood was pretty normal. It what does normal mean? What? Well, it means I lived in an area where it was mostly single homes, and within a half mile, there were three deckers. It was a, okay. a business community. And uh, so, you know, you went to YMCA boys camp, and, you know, that type of thing, mm -hmm. and the normal schooling, at least normal through the sixth grade. And then what changed? And, and then at, at age, well, prior to that, at age 10, I, I took on a Sunday paper route, and I, I built a Sunday paper route from 100 papers to eventually 330-odd papers. By yourself? By, yeah. Or do you have help? Well, no, just by soliciting and expanding the territory and early, early learning of sales. A young entrepreneur, <laughs> huh? Yeah, well, it worked out that way. Now, did you deliver or did you have people come and pick them up? How did you get that many delivered? No, they were, they were dropped at four o'clock on a corner and, and I had a wagon that was made out of a, uh, you know, a, a case that uh, had a, a casket in it, but I remade it, <laughs> and uh, it could take three big bundles. Kind of heavy, of though, for a young guy, isn't it? Well, that's the way it was. You did it anyway. Yeah, now this is, in the wintertime, did you have any trouble getting no, it around? No, because, you know, the streets were plowed, and... Okay, well, it worked fine. That's great. Anyway, so at age uh, thirteen, if you were in the top twenty-five percent of your class, the city school system had a prep school that you could go to, and it was for pre-college education, and we had French in the seventh grade and Latin in the eighth Whoa. grade. College prep. <laughs> College prep. Wow. But the interesting thing was that we went to school from 8 in the morning until 1 o'clock, which left the afternoons available to do other things. And in my case, I went to work in a mill, wished to tie a fabric, and I went and I worked from 1.30 until 5 o'clock, five days a week in school times. And what Starting at age 13. And was it a good paying job? Well. I'm being nosy. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> it was good because you got a dollar a day. Oh, so. overpaid again. <laughs> <laughs> Which, uh, that was a lot of money in those oh, days. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so that made a difference. And I'll have to continue on. I did that and the, uh, the idea of people growing up at that age was to finish high school and then get a job and have an income. Yep. So And have a trade if you could. And have a trade. So I went to high school and in my junior year of high school I, uh, I went to trade school after high school and became a machinist. And and, then, and that summer and the next year, I went to high school in the morning and finished up the last six months of high school working from three in the afternoon till midnight at Heald Machine Company. Wow. And uh, again, that was pretty good because that, you got paid a dollar an hour. So. Oh, you really climbed, <laughs> you and Donald Trump. <laughs> So I had I had a lot of money and I didn't have any place to spend it. So, but I I did find out that I I didn't want to continue to to work in a factory as a machinist. So I applied and and entered uh, the University of New Hampshire. 
in 1942. And, uh, and well, the three of us were at a, a room and we decided we'd, we'd join the Army Air Force. And Any which we did. Any particular reason or just it was thrilling uh, or something? No, I don't think it was. It was just the thing to do at that time okay, yeah. of life. And uh, World War II was was underway. And at least if you joined up, you had a choice of where you would go or what you would do. So you had that choice. Good. And I Boy, had that choice. I'm going to try to hold this up. I don't know that you can see it, folks. But this is Jack's class back in 1943. 42. Uh, 42, 43, okay. Uh, he's back here, the second one in, the second one over. From there, a lot of history is being made, okay? Go ahead. Yep. I'm just trying to keep it going. Okay, so to continue, uh, where was I? Were you just, <laughs> just joining the ROTC? Oh, yeah. Oh, we, I... I joined the ROTC, but that was part of it. But, but then we joined, the, the three of us joined the Army Air Force, and we were allowed to uh, finish that semester of college. Oh. And then we were called in in February, and there were maybe a hundred of us from all the different colleges, from Middlebury and Dartmouth, and St. Anselm's and mm -hmm. now, the where, where did you guys all muster? At Manchester or in Boston or where? When, when did you first go in and how was it getting into the service? We all started, left from Manchester, New Hampshire because that was a common place to okay. go. We went, by, point, yeah. we went by train to Fort Devons, Mass and then you got rid of your civilian your uh, civilian clothing and we uh, and we put on the uh, in the army. army well, how did you feel getting in after being sworn in and so forth? In the first couple of days in boot camp, how was your reaction to it? Very good. I was. We were interested in it. It was an interesting thing to do. Good. And so we went from Fort Devens to. Uh, Atlantic City, New Jersey. In Atlantic City, New Jersey, we lived in hotels, but we were exercising on the beach and doing exercises on what Brigantine Field, I think it was called. And we did that for maybe 30 days. And then there, were, there was an excess number of people wanting to get into the actual training of being a pilot mm -hmm. or a navigator or whatever. So they sent us to different colleges, primarily around New England, and I happened to go to uh, Rochester, New York. So uh, they called it a CTD. And so we were there maybe 45 to 60 days before they sent us from there to Nashville, Tennessee to go through, you know, all the rigors of uh, schooling, but mostly finding out if you were capable of doing what they wanted you to oh, yeah. be able to do. So we went to Nashville, and if they decided that you were capable of learning to be a pilot, they sent you or oh, they sent me to uh, Maxville Field in in Alabama, in Montgomery, Alabama. And we were there for maybe 90 days doing the hard work. Like first thing in the morning, you had to run five miles, as an example. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> and and then, you, then you went through the schooling and... And if you had any fat on you, you didn't have any fat on you when you left no, you didn't, you didn't. Maxwell Field. So, no, is that kind of a preliminary uh, 
selection basis so that they try to regiment you, you'd be a navigator, engineer, right. pilot, whatever. And they sent you to the different schools for that okay. reason. Now, how was the physicals? Were they pretty strict? Yeah, they were very strict. In other words, you had to have perfect eyesight and no physical problems, body okay, problems. Okay, good coordination. Yeah. So following Maxwell Field, then they sent you to primary school, primary flying school, and that was in Cape Girardeau, Missouri. And we, basically, we were flying single-engine, 100-horsepower aircraft. Well, we were, the Cubs kind of deal? No, it was larger than that. Uh, and there were two or three different kinds that some had radial engines and some had inline engines. Oh, okay. And uh, we finished that program, or oh, when you pass that program, then you said we were sent to basic training. And basic training was in a heavier aircraft, uh, the 450 or 300 horsepower engine called basic training. Now is this and dual control, single control, or a group, five or six guys? An initially, it was, you know, you had an instructor with you in, in primary school, and you had an instructor with you in basic training, but only for a, a short period of time. And then you were on your own. You soloed? Well, you soloed in both aircraft. Okay. And then, when you finished uh, basic training, we were sent to uh, Stuttgart, Arkansas for a multi-engine flying school called Advanced. So mm -hmm. we went through Advanced school and then you would do some night flying and blind flying and formation flying and all, all of the things that you were going to have to learn how to do when yeah, you're flying by combat. The seat of the pants, right? So we fly from Stuttgart to Memphis or Stuttgart over to the Mississippi River or over to East Texas and you know they were more than just local flying. Oh, yeah. So anything happened in those flights that stands out either good or bad or funny that uh, you remember or you'd like to talk about? No, I think I was always competent and was able to, Meet you the know, challenge, huh? okay, do cool. it, do it the way it was supposed to be done. And I graduated as a second lieutenant in in June of 1944, and uh, I stayed locally and just tested things that came out of the maintenance as a as a way to keep up with your flying ability. And then Uncle Sam decided that uh, they would send uh, 120 of us with multi-engine experience overseas to replace pilots that had been killed. And what was happening out of Europe is that uh, a new crew would come over with a first pilot and they would send the first pilot with an experienced crew in combat. And obviously 120 of them were killed on that first mission mm. so that it, it left that you had a co-pilot would be turned over to be a first pilot and then this 120 of us would fill in as co-pilots. Now, what Air Force were you assigned to over there? Now, this I was in the the Eighth Air Force. It's a second division with a B-24 group, and I was in the 389th Bomb Group and the 566 Squadron. And I learned how to fly the B-24 mm. in England. Oh, because I had no experience in a B-24 in this country. Wow, so, that's quite a transition, though, isn't it? Well, we... Yeah, must you did it, but... The way you did it, you went down to the flight line, and whatever was flying that day, you were it. And you fly... 
Oh, they didn't have a ship and a crew all set up? Or just no. Well, I did, but I was getting, I was to be a part of a, a crew where the, the pilot had been killed. Okay. okay. And I was, the co-pilot was to be the pilot, and I was to be the co-pilot. Okay. So that all came to be, and I passed all uh, the tests and was capable of handling a B-24. You could land it and take it off, you know, with and a crew. And walk away. And uh, okay. let's see, where are we? We're in oh, yeah. England. You're starting We're in England. And I flew my first mission on November 1st. And I flew the first six missions with an experienced pilot that was finishing up his 30 missions at that time. Okay. So Can he you tell us where you were heading from and to, or is that secret? I don't want, if you tell me, don't kill me. No, I have the whole list of them here of all the missions that I flew, but uh, basically we, we would take off well, you'd, you'd get up at 4 in the morning and have breakfast and go to the meetings where they More told you where you were going and mm -hmm. what was going to happen and the route that you're going to take. And, and then you'd fly out, and in our case, we'd fly on a 57 degree out over the North Sea and back again, and then we'd, we'd bunch on a buncher, a radio buncher, to get altitude. And when we reached about 15,000, we'd start flying due east. Or due whatever. east. And we'd go out over the North Sea and out over Belgium or Holland or whatever the, the route was. And we might be in a bomber stream of anywhere from 40 to uh, 800 aircraft. At one flight? In, well, all in, all in a bomber stream, one right after the other, all in groups of 12. And you would fly in different positions. Uh, you'd have a lead, three in the lead, and you'd have a high right and a low left and, mm -hmm. a, and a group underneath, 12 aircraft. And, and that would be your bombing pattern when, when you dropped the bombs. Okay. You'd all drop at the same time. Oh, were you ever the lead bomber? Lead flight? No, I was not a lead bomber. I was, I was, uh, I, I flew all the different positions, you know, whether, I, the day I got shot down, I was in the high left. But that's another story. Okay, we'll get to <laughs> it. Okay. So I did fly 18 missions and, uh, the 18th mission was to Magdeburg, and our, our, our assigned aircraft was Miss America, but the wheels wouldn't come up, so we had to abort that aircraft and pick up the spare aircraft, which was Delectable Doris. Let me stop right here. Uh, <laughs> Til okay. Uh, some of you guys may remember the Petty Gals. Dora is back here in all her resplendent beauty. If I can, I try to get it without shining, but that's delectable Dora, the gal that the guys flew for and with. Okay? I thank you, sir. Okay. So, to continue on, we were now in delectable Doris, but we were, were late joining the flight, so we were... We were still crossing Holland at 17,000 when the rest of them were at 20,000 plus. But we caught up to them before we diverted off. Like, we'd divert off and 100 aircraft would go here, 200 aircraft go there, and so on. Mm -hmm. And so our mission that day was Magdeburg. Any particular, really like a, a bearing shop or armament depot or something? No, in this case it was uh, an oil refinery okay. where where they were, you know, 
dependent on oil for oh, hell yeah. whatever happened. Between railroads and oil, those were the big dependencies at that stage. So, so this was on February 3rd of 1945, and it was pretty well clouded, so they canceled the dropping on Magdeburg and diverted us to Berlin. And in the process, I was flying and changing course onto an IP for the for the run in. for the run into Berlin, and that's where we got hit. Now, did you have any fighter escorts? We had fighter escorts into the target. That they'd peel and, off. And they would drop their wing tanks because yeah. they could only follow us that far with wing tanks. But when they, the fighters that would accompany us in to the main target would drop the wing tanks and then they'd get down on the deck and they'd shoot whatever was moving, mostly railroads mm -hmm. or, or Freight yards air, and that airplanes or marshalling yards, yeah. you know, that kind of stuff. But we, I got hit by an 88 and it took the nose off the aircraft. So we were at 23,000 feet it took the nose off, which took the front turret off, and the navigator, and uh, the top turret. And I was flying as co-pilot, so I was in this position, making a move. So I got shot all up the left side, and I all lost shrapnel. my shrapnel, right? And uh, I. I, my arm was cut in half. Well, it, the tendons were cut, and uh, and shrapnel all up the left side and into my face, and I was spitting blood. And uh, but I actually we were, the, the pilot was ribbons. He was cut to ribbons. Oh. So. So you, good had thing the, I you, wasn't, you were the, you had the ship. It was a good thing I was on the right side, not the left side that yeah. particular day, for me. But so we got hit at twenty three thousand, and uh, I came to at seventeen. The only instrument left was the altimeter, so I knew it was at seventeen nine. So what I did having these injuries, the first thing I tried to do was to get out of the seat. So I released the seat belt so I could move out, but I, I couldn't move because of the centrifugal force because we were in a spiral. Yeah. And the aircraft was on fire and I could look down through the bomb bay and there was nothing but fire and live bombs and at this stage, it disintegrated. It just blew apart. The aircraft just disintegrated where there was nothing left. And I was, I woke up flying through the air with no shoes, no hat, no gloves, nothing. I was only tied to my, my air suit. There was the only thing left that was left on me. And at what altitude? It must have been somewhere around 17,000 feet. And I, I woke up just in a cloud of debris, and I did recognize the radio, top of the radio table flying by, and all kinds of pieces of aluminum coming down like maple things the in the spring. This time of year, the <laughs> autumn that, leaves. That's what it yeah. looked like. So I, I continued in that position, just flying through the air. And when I got relief of all the debris that was around me, I decided I'd better pull the parachute. Yeah. So I pulled the D-ring, tossed that because there was no need of saving the D-ring. And I came down through three layers of clouds. And 
You were fully conscious now, though? Uh, fully conscious, and the thing that I still remember is how quiet it was. The, if you're coming down in a parachute, you know, at high altitude, there's no noise. So, so I came down, I, I couldn't control the parachute, so I slammed into a plowed field. And this was February 3rd, 1945, and one side was covered with snow and the other side facing the sun was starting to melt. And I was dragged for... And you couldn't spill your chute, yeah. No, I couldn't spill the chute, so, so I was being dragged. I got dragged over this plowed area field for maybe half a mile. My whole front of my suit was was worn worn off and I have the scars on my legs, you know, from that activity. Mm -hmm. And finally I said, Hey God, you better stop the wind or I'm not gonna yeah, make it. I don't trust this guy. <laughs> and the wind stopped, I crawled onto the chute and, uh, and uh, you wrapped yourself in it? No, I didn't wrap it. No, I, I was lucky just to make it up there because I had nothing but the flying suit all worn out. Yeah. And uh, probably within 10 or 20 minutes, uh, a local Gestapo person came up with some helpers and they brought a horse and wagon, and uh, they they took me back to the small town, and they put me in a garage with a dirt floor, and I was there on February third, and I was there on February fourth, and on February fifth, uh, uh, some different people came to pick me up and they took me to uh, Brunswick Naval Air Station. And I was put in jail there. Brunswick where? Uh, German. I, only Brun oh, because uh, all I know is Brunswick, Maine. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. no. Let me stop you just a second. But, uh, you, you came down, but how about the rest of the crew? Did they be able to get out or bail out or all? No, there was only one other person that got out. His name is Billy Weidman. He was the the right waist gunner. Okay. Ag again, we had 6,000 pounds of, of bombs and maybe 2,000 gallons of high-octane fuel that Oof. ignited and disintegrated. And there was nothing, I couldn't see anything of any size other than this Shreds ma of massive stuff. Anyway, so on the third day, I was taken to this uh, Brunswick Air Base, and I was put in jail. And then the following day, you know, I was given, I had nothing to eat or drink in that time. For and the three days? For three days. So uh, I was given some gruel and some water when I get into the jail. And the next day, they they tried to put a cast on my leg, but I, I was missing, you know, three inches in the middle of my leg. But they they put a cast on it, but it, it was as big as my thigh then. Mm. And uh, were you given so, any medication or anything like that so to try to no, help ease the pain, or they just wrap you like a piece of meat? That's all. And there was no medications involved at all. And uh, the, the day following that, they took me out to the railroad station, and that's when I came into it with, with Billy Weidman, who was the other one that got away and landed in a similar okay. territory. And they put us on a train which would be a civilian train, but they put us in the boxcar, and I was a litter patient. 
and I was a litter patient for the rest of my stay. I, I was always never on my feet. Oh. So, but you know, survival is survival. So yeah. you do what you have to do. Now, was the guy, your other buddy, was he uh, enlisted? So that, did they just have officers for one group and uh, enlisted men for another? How did they handle that? Later on, he was a staff sergeant. Okay. <coughs> so in, so they took us by train to what they called Dulag Luft, which was an interrogation center, which was maybe a hundred plus miles from where I was shot down. See, I was shot down, Magdeburg is over by Czechoslovakia. So, but most of the train things were, were broken up to the extent that it took a long time to travel all the way to Frankfurt from where I was. So we went up over through Hanover and over by the North Sea and back down Oh, the scenic to, group. to Frankfurt, right? <laughs> a real scenic group, and uh, anyway, it was maybe ten days in in transit. It was seventeen days in all from when I was shot down until I arrived at this interrogation center at Dulag Luft, and there wasn't much to interrogate. You know, it's it was so long since I was shot down until they were talking to me. But they knew where I went to school. They knew where I was born and brought up. Wow. And they knew all that, that stuff. That a good G2, huh? So, yeah. And they knew the outfit that I was with. Then then they, they sent me from there to Stalag 9C, which was an orthopedic center. And uh, so I, I went to the orthopedic center, but the orthopedic center turned out to be just uh, a great big warehouse with maybe 200 beds in it, one right after the other. And uh, so that was... Did they have to do any work trying to reduce your cast and not lining it up and so on? Yeah, what they did, they put... They drilled a hole in my ankle, and they put a Kirsten wire in there. That's what they called it, to to drag it out because at that time it was atrophying and and it was okay. The muscles were playing was, games. Well, it was the bone was broken up inside, so and then they put you up over a thing. They and they tie a rope to this Kirsten wire and put it over with the weight on the other side of it. So most of the time I spent with my leg up like this. Always in traction. Then. In traction. Yeah. But it would come and it would go. You know, it it wasn't very steady because the, there was nothing they could do except to try and keep, keep it extended. Up, yeah. Right. And uh, so actually what they did, they they did uh, re repair. They they tied the tendons together because I I wound up pretty much this way, but they tied the tendons together and the knots are still in my thing here. And that's about what they could do. There were there were four British doctors there plus a surgeon. From, from Germany that, that did whatever they could do, but there were no bandages, no medication, no nothing. Must have and, like hell. And, and, and we didn't, but they did get rid of the infection that was in my arm. They had a, a poultice, kind of a pre-runner of penicillin, I think, mm -hmm. that they dripped into it. Okay. And, uh, Anyway, that allowed me to survive. Yeah. Now, how so, were you there until you were relieved or re uh, released, whatever? Well, I was there, and I think it was the 4th Armored, but I'm not sure of that designation, came in and encircled us so that we were relieved that way, but 
but nothing happened because there were no supplies came in or that. We had to wait for ambulances to come all the way from somewhere to take us back to Frankfurt, which we did. So I w keep in mind now we didn't eat. That's what I was going to ask you. What, what kind of chow were you getting? If any. Well, it was probably literally nothing. We we called it tree trunk soup. <laughs> <laughs> Sound like my cooking. Once once a once a day you had a bowl of tree trunk soup and water, and that was the extent of it. No well, black bread or anything like that, or cabbage. No. Once in a while you'd have a black bread, but you'd have to divide it between twenty two men. Yeah. And it was pretty much made out of sawdust, you know, I think. Well, it was and, oats. And the hot coffee was made out of acorns, so that, so, so we did have, like, coffee in, in the morning, and that was it. And we had the, the tree trunk soup at night, so, so we didn't really gain. We just turned in the skin and bones. Yeah. Now, when you uh, you say it was the fourth or whoever relieved you, where did you then go back to England, or did you send you back to the states? No. Uh, what happened? They took us by ambulance to Frankfurt, and in Frankfurt, they flew us to uh, Le Bourget Field in Paris, and they put us in GH1, which was General Hospital Number One to get cleaned up. I still had the mud in my hair oh. on on May 6th or May 5th that I had on February 3rd and I never got washed. The dirt was still on my hand and of course this one was not usable. But they cleaned us up there in GH1 and they decided that unless we went back to the States we weren't going to make it. Because I weighed 97 pounds. So my normal so weight... It was a low-carb diet for a while. <laughs> my, normal, my normal weight, is, as it is now, is 75 pounds dressed. And I weighed 97 pounds in that hospital. And the day... You might show them the, the picture of that uh, when the war ended. This one? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'll hold this one up. This is a good one to see. I I, I arrived in uh, in Paris either May fifth or May sixth. The war ended on the seventh, and this picture was a stars and stripes from May eighth. I think it's May eighth. Yeah, the Paris and, edition. And, yeah, May 8, 1945. Yeah. So that's what I brought home. <laughs> Good deal. So no. really, that's all I had. But they flew us out, and they went down. We went to Spain, and then we went uh, from, from Le Bourget. They flew us uh, down to the Azores. And then I think it's called the Azores outside of Spain, and then and then up to Newfoundland and back to New York. That's that's the route that they took. Wow. Of course, you go by the way the the short way yeah. when you're looking at a globe. And uh, I we arrived. Keep in mind this was on the eighth of May. We went that route, and we arrived in New York City on the tenth. That that's how the continuous zigzag, yeah. it was. We we arrived in this hospital plane in in New York on the tenth, and then we were we were sent on the eleventh up to Framingham, Mass. In, into the hospital there, Cushing General Cushing Hospital. General, yeah. So I arrived and entered Cushing General Hospital on May 12th. 
So that's how fast they took care of us. Good. Good. And uh, so in Cushing General Hospital, in the, in the next period of time, uh, they did some some things, you know, with my arms and exercises and straighten or starting to straighten that out. And, uh, and they operated on my leg, and so I have a scar from my ankle to my knee where they pieced together my leg. Put pieces in yeah. there? Yeah. Well, they took a piece of the bottom up and they covered the, the missing three inches. And so that worked out well, and uh, this, all the surgery was in this VA hospital called Cushing General Hospital, and they were wonderful. Now, uh, while you were in that hospital, you had been married, I believe. No, was I wasn't married then, but... <clears throat> when did all, all that good stuff happen? All the good stuff was my wife used to come down to visit me. <clears throat> Framingham is 20 miles roughly from Worcester, so you could come by bus and visit. Mm -hmm. And so we decided uh, we get married. Well, you were, you were high school sweethearts. One oh time. yeah, we we were sweethearts in high school, and we went different ways, but always came back together. Yeah. And uh, good feeling. Yeah, and it, and it goes on today. Oh yeah, we. We've been married 66 years as of last July 6th. Are you going to make and it permanent then? We're going to, yeah, we're going to stay with it. How about your kids? Yeah, you what, a boy and a girl, I believe. No, I have two girls. Two, two, oh, okay. And uh, as I say, we got married on July 6th. Well, we were still in, in, uh, under control of the hospital. But I was able to go back to school on the GI Bill Good. and uh, and finish school at University of New Hampshire. And uh, so we, we moved to Portsmouth and finished school there, graduated in 1948, went to work for International Harvester Company on uh, July 1 of 48, and then I have a whole bunch of things. But in the meantime, we had a daughter, Pamela, who is now 65. Just a kid. <laughs> and, and we, in the process, uh, we, we went to the school for a year living in Portsmouth and also living in Brighton. And uh, when I got along, we rented a, a house in Somerville, or an apartment in Somerville, and uh, was doing pretty well in the selling game. So I built a house in Natick, Mass, and we moved there. And then you were always looking for a promotion or the next step. Yeah, so, one, one, one. So I went from Natick to, uh, <clears throat> to Maine. Brunswick, Maine? No, no what I thought I'd try. <laughs> Waterville, Maine. Okay. And we lived there. And then I bid on another job and went down to southern Massachusetts into Somerset, which is down near yeah. Fall River. Yeah. And uh, we, we lived on a farm there with horses and all that kind of thing. And it was great living, but Jen was afraid of the kids in the barn. But then I had another daughter, which when we were in Natick, Barbara. And uh, so I built, though I, my territory has increased to, uh, include Rhode Island as well as southern Massachusetts and the Cape and the islands. So I built a house over in uh, Barrington, Rhode Island. This is the second house I built. Yeah, I'm counting. <laughs> and, uh, and that went well, and we were there maybe four years. 
before I bid on the job in Manchester, New Hampshire. And when I came here, obviously I had to build another house, which, which I did. Now, is that the one you're living in today? And that's the one I'm living in today. And it was originally in an apple orchard on top of the hill right near the VA hospital. And now the it's a total neighborhood now, yeah. a wonderful neighborhood. Bing, 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 but, all around you. But we just decided we'd stay there. And, and Jen thought it'd be nice where the kids were getting older and in school that we stayed in one school system rather than skipping from oh, here yeah. to there. So up until that time, that was our eighth move wow. and the third house that we built. So, so And we've stayed there ever since. Now, I, I'll use the word advisedly, but you're retired now, but I guess you're busy and all heck doing a lot of other things that you like to be interested in. Well, when, I would... I was very busy while I was working, yeah. and uh, among them I was a uh, director of the YMCA and eventually the vice president, and I was a director in the Chamber of Commerce and eventually the vice president of the Chamber of Commerce, and I was a president of the Ambassador Club, and I was a, I, busy. <coughs> Busy, busy, busy yeah. in all the activities and you still that I was have a, in. Yeah, a drive to keep going and relaxing a bit, but taking it yeah. with you. Good. <coughs> I I did take the early retirement from the <clears throat> international uh, international harvester company truck division, and I went to work for uh, rider truck leasing for another ten years. Mm. So I had 30 years with International and 10 years with Ryder, and and I wound up not not taking any other responsibilities well, of jobs or that type of thing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hate so, to say this, but I'm going to have to cut it back a bit. I'd like to, if you will, you've got a couple of little citations here. I'd like you to show them and explain what they are to the audience, please, if you can. GFC, well, Purple Heart, you know, Air Metal. Yeah, this is a Purple Heart, and these are pilot wings. So let's hold this, them up so people can yeah. Okay, I'll hold them up so you can yeah. see them. Yep, yeah. this is a, be a Purple Heart, and this is the Air Metal with two or three clusters. Now what do the clusters signify? Every time you flew six missions, you got a, another cluster, so-called. Okay. And, uh, and then this is a Purple Heart medal. That's a POW. No, that's a POW medal, I'm yeah. sorry. And uh, I'm sure there's some others, but I don't really pay much attention no. to them. So, but it, it keeps the grandkids happy. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, question: All that you've seen and done, would you say that your experience in the service has helped you? Was it a positive or a negative impact on your life? Very positive, and to to the extent that I would recommend that everyone, when they finished high school or turned 18, get involved in government service. Okay. I, I, either a year or two of government service. Now, a government you mean the, in the armed services as opposed to postmaster or something like that? Army, Navy, Marines, Coast well, Guard? Depends on what, what they like to do. What they like to do. Uh, they don't have to be in a, in a military situation necessarily, but but that's available, that they would go through all the training that a person needs. And you get people from different types of life, of living, would get to know each other, and yeah. obviously they'd grow up. Yeah, to learn and, to respect each other. And learn to respect yeah. one another. Amen, so, amen. So that's what I would recommend. But overall, my biggest love, naturally, is my family. 
Amen. And, and your grandkids. My children and the grandkids. And that's the biggest thing of Genevieve. Jen, my wife, and I, Good. that's what we look forward to on a daily basis. And All I can say is thank goodness. Yeah. Hey, buddy. You're still nice and warm. Well, thank, thank you. you. I have good, thank circula you for your good circulation. Yeah, okay. I hate to say it, folks, but again, we have to close up. It's about time to pull the plug. But my name is Bob Stevens, and if you'd like to try and get information about coming, doing your own show, the address will be falling at the end here. But whatever it is, please, if you can, come and show us. If you have other friends that, who may be veterans, Spread the word, because the more people we can get to feel what is going on, the better the picture is going to be for us and the people after us. Again, I thank you for listening. Come back and see us, please. Stay healthy.